Warren Smith, Head of Sport and Factual at Box to Box Films. Thanks very much for joining us on the Sports Pro Podcast. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I'm here with Warren and Tom Bassam, our usual po- podcast host. Uh, I'm Sam Cop, who is the features editor here at Sports Pro. Um, I mean, yeah, Box to Box really shot to prominence, uh, probably in sports industry circles, following the success of the Drive to Survive docuseries on Netflix, which um, which we'll get into later. Is about to start its sixth season um, and has been like widely credited, I guess, with uh, bringing Formula One to new audiences and also kind of, I guess, kickstarting this era of the sports documentary, yeah. really, I guess. Um, before we get into all that, um, let's just talk a little bit about you, I guess. You know, how did you come to be involved in, in Box to Box? And I suppose, what's it like working there at the moment? I mean, to come to the, the, the final part of the question, is is great. I mean, look, we, we get the opportunity to go to some of the biggest sporting events in the world. And it's exciting because... We are known for the sports shows, but also we're looking at non-sport as well. So there's a lot of great things that are coming up and I feel really privileged because whereas the industry may be quiet, I feel like we're, we're in a really sort of good vein of health. So actually we've got a lot of great, great producers, directors, uh, and also sort of the sports that we are working in are uh, sort of embracing us. So I think from that perspective, it's brilliant. For my mind, I've been at Box to Box now for over three and a half years. I came in as a showrunner on, um, on the first season of Make or Break, which is an Apple TV Plus series. It was sort of the first sort of series, long form series that Box to Box had done after Drive to Survive. I know they'd done obviously sort of series that were more sort of historic and things like that. But in terms of the, the sort of sports access doc, I suppose it was the second one. And Drive had, had just dropped around, I think it just had season two, it was just dropping, season three was coming up, or it was midway through the filming of season three when I joined. So it had been a huge success. So I knew that sort of my job as a showrunner on that, at that time was to sort of like, well, exactly what it says, it's to run the show, build a team, but also how do you follow Drive Survive? Mm-hmm. Um, so luckily for us, we got on a plane to Hawaii, which isn't too bad in the middle of COVID. Um, and then that was it. The rest is history. I spent a bit of time with James and Paul, actually. I spent sort of eight weeks in Australia with, with Paul, one of the, the co-founders, which was almost like sort of three years in a, in a, in a sort of <laughs> contained period because we were living together, yeah. having to learn the box-to-box way. And I would say that. I think box-to-box, although I've come from a very traditional television background, you know, nearly 20 years of going doing every role from runner, researcher, AP, producer, director, et cetera, et cetera, sort of James and Paul don't. And I think that's what's really refreshing about, about the company because we have sort of the producers, directors, the production managers, the talent that come in, who do have that history but you know James is from more of a sort of feature documentaries or actually scripted background Uh, and Paul has done a sort of mixture of lots of different things as well whether it be journalists or you know game shows or sales or whatever and I think the the combination of that a bit of a melting pot and I I think that's where it's great because it's not like okay this is how we do it and this Mm -hmm. is how you make a tv show it's sort of well how how are we going to make this different how are we going to improve it and I think that's it so I came in on that season and then sort of after that sort of moved into sort of a more of an in-house exec position, which is sort of executive producer, and that's overseeing the showrunner that I would have been previously, um, and then also sort of running a couple of different shows. And then, you know, as we grew, then I've sort of stepped into the sort of head of sport and factual role, which my job really is to support James and Paul and their vision for the company, but also make sure that I can be across as many of the shows and, and essentially delivering our sports slate to Netflix, Apple, Amazon. Had you had much of a background with with sports content before? Where, or I mean, you, I mean, you were saying before we hit hit record that you'd d- just done SAS. Uh, you're working on SAS before, but like, do you feel? And also, do you feel like you need to have a bit that sport background to do a show like Drive to Survive or to do to work on Box Box's production slate? You definitely don't need that um, sports. I'd never worked on in a television perspective. I love sport. I love playing sport as a kid. Football was my sort of passion. Um, you know, like most people in the UK you're a failed um, you know wannabe footballer <laughs> and then you sort of get into television and you want to make shows and I, and I was lucky enough to to make some great great TV um, and I think you've always you know that sports um, there's something about competitive nature of sport which you need to make sports documentaries because you're having to go into these worlds where you're, you're dealing with the elite of the elite mm. and you know I might have been playing sort of like semi-pro lower leagues football but you still know what a dressing room environment's like you still know when to to talk and when to actually shut up because 
you know, the coach is talking, a player, etc. And I think having a little bit of that background does help, um, but it doesn't mean you have to have that. I think sort of the key for me is being able to understand and how to sort of negotiate things with the world that is at his, at his best. And I think previous to this, I did SES Who Dares Wins, and in that space, you know, you're dealing with special forces, um, you know, operators who, who can be tricky. You, I've worked in you know, schools on a show called Educating where you're dealing with sort of headmasters and teachers. So it's all about access and, and relationships really and building a trust with whether it be a, you know, someone from the military, a sports person or even a teacher. I think it's all about personal skills, having that relationship and, and also knowing when you actually, when no actually means no <laughs> and when no means you actually can push a bit further i think that's the key so yeah. not necessarily having to be from a sports background no but i do think being able to be in that environment does does help yeah do you ever sort of like <laughs> when you first started this role was there ever an element of being a little bit starstruck because you guys are working with such you know these global athletes who have such massive followings you see yeah. them on the screen all the time all of a sudden you'd kind of hanging out with them in a pretty relaxed environment, I suppose, and kind of getting to know them, at, probably at their most vulnerable, I guess. Some of the stuff they tell you isn't what they usually disclose to kind of an official broadcaster or when they're talking to the to sort of to the press, I suppose. Is it is it quite interesting sort of getting to know those athletes and working with them on that level? It, yeah, it's amazing. I think it's a privilege. I think sort of the best thing for me is I sort of had my introduction through surfing. Mm. And I, I, honestly, I've got the hugest admiration for those those athletes because i think as athletes they're unbelievable because you can't even stand up let alone go in apparel mm. but it wasn't a sport that i really had any sort of background knowledge of so it just allowed me to do the job in the way that i would do anyway so then when you did step into the pga tour or other worlds that you know sort of a little bit more it's less so and also i think the way that we we build the company is we want sort of directors and producers that build trust and relationships with individual athletes as well so sometimes in my role i don't want to step over the mark too much and become best mates with with an athlete because mm. essentially you want to have that separation so you can tell their story mm. obviously you're there if there's any conversations to be had and needed but sometimes you want those producer directors we call them to build that trust and relationship themselves and 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 you don't want to feel like you're stepping on their toes at, at, at points um so yeah i mean when we you know I do sometimes think, wow, I'm like in this event, whether it be Wimbledon or sort of, you know, the Masters or at Silverstone. But but in terms of starstruck nature, it's just getting a bit of a... I've always been the same way, even when I was a, a producer director filming with a camera. You just get in a bit of a zone. Yeah. So you're not really thinking about, wow, you know, what it is. It just becomes a job. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Let's, um, I guess let's talk a little bit about Drive to Survive now. I know that you... As you mentioned, you sort of joined the company after, I guess it was after the first couple of seasons, yeah. right? So, um, but I mean, when that first came out in 2019, and the sports documentary space was a lot less saturated than it is now. And was kind of, since then, it's kind of been held up as a reference point for the industry, right? And I think what's noticeable is that every time a new sports documentary is announced, it's probably described as a drive to, drive to survive style yeah. uh, series. And it's kind of, the idea is that sport is kind of chasing that same sort of effect. Um, kind of looking back on when it first launched, even just, you know, as someone who perhaps viewed the show and also working on it now, why do you think it is that it has been so successful and has had the impact that it has? I think sort of like from a company perspective, as I mentioned it earlier, you know, James and Paul don't, and the team, you know, not just those two, the, 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 other, the rest of the team as well, don't approach these things in a sort of the same way as lots of sort of TV producers would initially. Mm. So it's about sort of like, building trust i think james came you know had made the film senna so having that you know respect i suppose from the from the formula one community mm -hmm. goes a long way but then it's about sort of building access and trust and, and doing that and i think that's what you get from the show you know you're in those moments where you're like oh my god they were there mm -hmm. like and i think sometimes you watch you know look i'm not saying anything negative about anybody else's work but sometimes you watch some things and you think right this is a bit of a puff piece for that football team or that that sort mm -hmm. of individual club or whatever whereas i think the beauty of formula one drive survive is you know you're doing multiple teams so you can't do a puff piece for everybody and one season might be positive for you the next season might be negative whether that be a team or a, an individual and that goes the same as golf or you know tennis or, or whatever we're, we're working on so i think i think that is the slight difference because actually you're telling multiple nuanced stories rather than right okay this is the story of you know this sports team and you know they've got sign off on the edit etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm. and i think that that 
that is the difference in that show, in my, my opinion. Mm. Does that mean then, if you've, you made that, so you've got, you're coming into the company, you've made that uh, first, uh, first couple of series, um, is it easier to go and then have those conversations with other places and look and be like, no, this is what we're going to do, this is what we're not going to do? Um, but they've seen your work, so they're, so they're already like, yeah, we're, we're on board. Is it, does it just make those conversations easier when it comes to new projects? It does, but I think every sport has their own sort of background and sort of identity and that and sort of what comes with it is sort of, you know, okay, we're not the same as Formula One, we're not the same as this, whether it be rugby, whether it be um, cycling, etc. So I think every conversation is different. Yeah, I think as a sport, they will want that sort of drive to survive effect, which is talked about a lot. But it, as an individual, you just want to win your race game sort of tournament, whatever you're doing. You're not really bothered about the cameras. But I think sort of for me, yeah, the conversations are easier because we can say, you know, we aren't there to, to, to be a gotcha program or whatever. But they've seen the shows. They've seen sort of it's not always positive. There mm. are some negatives. But they also see the benefits from the shows. So I think, I think from that perspective, having Drive Survive out there in front is a definite, definite um, positive thing. You know, 100% when we came into you know, golf, everybody's talking about that. Well, you know, Ferrari and Mercedes didn't do season one, so maybe I wouldn't, won't. And actually, golf did lean in in the season one, and it just made that show to pop um, straight off the bat. So I think sort of that is key. And if you didn't, hadn't got Drive Survive two or three se seasons under its belt, would those golfers, would those other players have actually lent into the sport? I'm not sure. Mm, yeah. Is there an element of pressure that comes with the Drive to Survive tag as well? Because I suppose whenever you guys take on a new project, um, again, the press will describe it, you guys as kind of the makers of the Drive to Survive documentary, right? That's kind of how the reputation within the sport has grown, at least. Does that add an element of pressure to sort of emulate the impact of that show? Or do you guys not really think about that when you're working on other projects? I don't think you think about the end goal. Yeah. I think you just make the best stories possible. I think when we have development chats and conversations now, we have to be looking at what's different, like what's individually different about this sport, what, mm. what sort of sets this sport apart from the others. Because, you know, the thing about Formula One is it's pretty much life and death. You crash that car, there's big risk, yeah? And some sports don't have that. So you're leaning into other bigger stories, whether it be a political story with this, you know, saudi back live, or whether it be sort of a character story, or even like you look at Tour de France where, you know, they're throwing themselves down, well, not throwing themselves, but they're going down a mountain in Lycra, and if they come off, that's it, yeah. game over. So I think sort of, you know, stakes are different in every sport. And I think that's our key is to sort of really tap into what makes that individual sport sort of sing. I mean, we're not in the game of cookie cutter and going, you know, we don't sit there and go, right, at three minutes 50, that happens in drive, so we've got to do that in this show. Mm. But it's about sort of learning lessons from that, but also moving it on and trying to be creative and just not essentially, yeah, like I say, not being cookie cutter versions of, drive survive of this sport, this sport, and this sport. Because otherwise, people just get bored of that. Mm -hmm. um, viewer will. They'll soon sniff it out, and we don't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. I think one of the interesting things for me about, like, uh, the, the especially um, Full Swing, um, and actually in Drive to Survive too, is the, is the stories that you tell that actually probably you don't hear all that much, because usually sport is about the winners. Yeah, um, and in yeah in, in in these series, like you hear from people that aren't like you hear from Joel Damon, who is rarely a winner on the PGA Tour, but is a really really interesting character, um, and you hear from like the teams at the back of the pack in Formula One, like is it in like is there is it in some ways more fun to tell those stories than it is to do like they they won like that's it. I think sort of a lot of that comes from. It was from necessity where, you know, before my time, but the fact that Mercedes and Ferraris didn't do mm. season one of Drive, it made that team have to open up their lens of going, well, what, what are we going to cover? And then you all of a sudden you uncover Gunther and you undercover, uncover these stories. So when we went into uh, golf, you know, Joel was one of those where I think my first tournament was Phoenix, Guampo, we call it now, like the waste management Phoenix Open. And, you know, he was there with Harry Higgs taking his shirt off, swigging a beer and running off. I'm like, oh, what? How the hell? You know, who's this character? And straight away you start learning and, and digging. And, and the thing, the way we do is we try and find stories. And I remember one of the producers coming and saying, oh, he's got this background with his caddy. They were schoolmates. They were this, that. And so and you start, like, unpeeling the, the sort of narrative. And you're like, wow, that's, that's much more compelling than just another winning story. So I think the winning stories and narratives have to be there. Mm. But, yeah. And look, season two, um, quite a powerful episode with Joel, where it's coming to terms that he's now pretty famous, 
not necessarily for his golf game, <laughs> more so for being involved in the full swing. Mm. And actually how that impacts him, you know, he's never really been that guy where you know, the gallery crowd follows him round, but now he is. And he's like alongside Jordan Spieth and, and JT and those guys, Rory and McIlroy and stuff, in terms of a fan's favourite. And actually how does that affect his game? So, you know, the show can impact storylines in the same way as, you know, uh, just the game of, you know, the actual tournament itself. Mm. Yeah, I guess that's a pretty good example, though, right? I suppose you mentioned there about Mercedes and Ferrari not wanting to be involved, and that gives other teams on the grid an opportunity, as you mentioned there. It gives uh, these kind of shows, give other golfers, lesser known golfers, an opportunity. Um, do you think the longer you've done this, essentially, I think, you know, whether they're teams, whether they're executives, whether they're the athletes who are perhaps at the start of this a little bit closed off and didn't want to give the house away and were kind of quite protective over you know, their habits, their story, maybe those ones that thought they were maybe a little bit too big for the show, um, they've started to realise the benefits of it as well and being involved in them. I hope so. I think sort of um, it's amazing every new season you turn up on how quickly it sort of resets back to yeah. you've got to win over that trust. But I think that's why it's such a good thing about having... We've got an amazing team, both in the UK and the US, who we sort of move around shows and also build that relationship and trust because they've been through it. Um, we, we, if someone's good comes through the door at Box Box, we usually sort of lock them in and keep right. them there. I mean, it's pretty good shows to work on as well, but it is how you deal with that because it, it's not for everyone having to turn up. And think, oh, that was sort of, it was really sort of, we were really close, <laughs> and now all of a sudden, like, you're not, and you know, and you never know what's going on in their personal lives, and that's our job to obviously un unpick that for the storylines. But you know, when you rock up at the start of the season, it's like reset, and actually, you've got to always remember the number one priority for them is to win. Mm. sporting event yeah you know, they're not thinking oh i've got to do the netflix show yeah i don't think anybody really is i think sort of some people understand the benefits of that but their number one goal is their job and their job is to win whether it be you know a, a race on a formula one in a formula one car or a golf tournament or a, a rugby match so i think sort of we've always got to meet meet that sort of as, and, and also know and and respect that as well mm. that that is their priority mm. do you get a sort of designated amount of time with sort of the talent and the executives because I guess when it's all packaged up at the end it feel into sort of eight episodes or whatever it feels as though they've been sat with you for ages um and telling you very and reacting to various different things at various different points um in the season but I imagine the time has to be limited because of what you just mentioned is there a way that you are there sort of certain techniques that the guys behind the camera use to you know get them to be vulnerable with them and kind of coax out the sort of the the lines that maybe the other other interviewers aren't going to be able to get. I think the big thing for us is is sort of the beginning before we even pick up a camera is having a conversation and saying sort of what do you, what's your story? What do you want the world to know about you? Because yeah. a lot of sports narrative is what's printed well formerly in the papers now on sort of sports websites etc. And that's what everybody takes in. And sometimes you know I think you know the Brooks Kepka in season one or whatever. I don't think when Paul sat down with him in in, in the Palmers, which was the first sort of interview, I don't think we ever realised that he would be in that headspace. And then all of a sudden it opens up this amazing sort of narrative. Um, so I think that's the thing, is giving that time to sort of, if you get it, can't get it with everyone, there's certain people that you just know, you know their time is precious and you know, everybody's time is precious, but there's some that you just know, well, they're getting called left, right and centre, so you take what you can take. But the ones that do lean in, the Joels, the sort of, you know, the Gunters, the Christians, etc., in, in historically they will be the ones that will give you more and therefore will probably benefit more from the show because it's a true reflection of their character rather than what we would call b-roll and interview which is just shots of them doing something mm. that doesn't really relate to the story which we don't we're not in the game to do you know i think sort of there was a story that I was telling someone the other day of sort of the latest series of drive to survive where we had two of the biggest sports stars in the world i think lewis hamilton and tom brady but, but they weren't talking about the show. They weren't talking about they weren't talking about the narrative that is there. It was just sort of just them playing golf. And in a season one, that'd probably be enough. But now, sort of season five or six, it, it's not. You know, you've got to they've got to make sure because I think there's an expectation of the the viewer now because of mainly drive and golf and etc. Of that, you know, every scene is like a drama and it needs to sort of move the story forward. So our job as producers is to try and sort of capture that and make sure that the teams come back with actually some great storylines. Mm. How do you like, how do you ensure, how do you set up for success to do that? Like what goes into making like a, yeah, a episode of um, 
drive to survival or full swing or um, break point. Like teams go, like the teams go out. You, know, you have the idea before. The teams go out and they do the interviews. Like take, take me through that process. Sort of it usually starts with trying to sort of get. You know, we're doing at the moment. There's a couple of new first seasons that we're doing in the US. It starts with Zooms a lot of it now. It's amazing, like you know what COVID has done. Really, you can get on. You've got, you know, you can get jump on with. The, one of the biggest athletes in the world, if they've got five minutes, and just talk them through the process, and, and um, you know, that's that's key. First of all, is, is as answering their questions and understanding what they're doing, and then I think sort of not necessarily having cameras on straight away. Sometimes we do audio interviews, probably giving away a bit of a trick there, but you know, getting in the head, it might be over a coffee, a beer, but it's a conversation like this. Mm. Pretty much is a bit like a podcast because you're just asking them whatever, and you're not there like list of questions and like so. Tell me about like. Mm. The next question, next question. It's sort of, you know, if they start going down a route, you let them go down that route. And I think that's the beauty of these. And then sort of obviously the on-camera stuff is important once we know the story. But it allows us to sort of then, once they've told us their story, we can then look for that story through the year. Right. So if someone's going, oh, this is where I think I am this year, this is where I'm placing the sort of leadership, or this is where my, my problems are, you're then shooting for that narrative that they've already told you is in their head. So you're not just going randomly and scattergun mm. filming whatever you can get. So it's just being a bit focused, I think. And also, like on some of our sports, it's like, you know, there's 150 golfers at the tournament, 120 tennis players. You can't cover everything. So the teams have to be really focused. And, you know, just don't pivot all the time. It's like you have to, it's like anything. You have to have a beginning, middle, and an end. And if all of a sudden you've got like 24 beginnings and no middles and a couple of ends, it's going to be really hard in the edit. So you've got to commit and stick there. And obviously, if there's a couple that are just blow up, like, you know, Wyndham Clark winning the US Open came from nowhere for our, in our team, you know, and those stories, you've got to capture those moments. But actually, that storyline, which it goes back to that Formula One thing, it's like coming fifth or sixth can be as powerful as coming first. So it's sticking with that story if you've been following it from the beginning, I think, is always key because we yeah. all want to see the the full arc of a narrative, not just necessarily right the winning moment. Mm, yeah. Does the sports, sorry Sam, sorry. Um, does the sports make that harder in that like stuff will just happen and then you've got to react to it? Yeah, I think sort of like people obviously probably think it's pretty easy doing what we do, we just turn up a sporting event and it's happening so we just film it, but it is pretty tough when you, you know, you've got you to cover your bets a little bit and um, you know, a lot of times you'll go down and the amount of times directors are like, oh that was amazing, you're like, well, it doesn't relate. It was, you know, I think, Sometimes as well, things will be filmed one year and they just won't make sense because there's no payoff, no sporting payoff. But a year later, so you have to have these conversations which can be quite hard of like, well, you've given up all this time commitment, you're not in the show, but actually we've had it now where but a year later that story actually pays off so you can use all that footage from the previous year. And, and I think that management and relationships, the teams that do that with, with the F F1, with golfers, whatever, they do an amazing job really. And I, you know, sometimes we don't always... Capture, capture it and we go shit we forgot mm. we forgot about that bit but I think that's the key because it's not you know we don't see these as sort of like season ones to season sixes we see them as the 2024 season mm. or 2024 like five whatever and then you know things that happen this year may impact next year etc so hopefully there's a sort of long term relationship with, with the sports yeah I was about to say it must be like <laughs> semi-annoying sometimes when you've invested a lot of time in one of the athletes and you think they're sort of destined to say you know win a major or whatever and it kind of doesn't quite work out that way but I guess on the other on the other side of that sometimes that makes for a better story right and I think I remember watching season one of Full Swing for example and you're following around Matt Fitzpatrick a lot of the time and him coming really close to winning that major and eventually he does get that and that kind of plays out over the course yeah. of a few episodes and the sort of the build up to that moment is um yeah something that keeps you as a viewer hooked i guess um but i guess you're obviously also you're having to react to the things that are happening say on the course on the on the on the court on the track etc um but i suppose in some cases especially in uh, with full swing you're having to react to things happening a lot higher yeah. up as you've already mentioned um does that like just how flexible do you have to be with things like that and also does it maybe make it a little bit more challenging to get the access you need when things are kind of happening at that governance level, I guess, because, you know, live and the PGA is such a highly politicized issue. It's, you know, it's geopolitical, there's, uh, there's states involved. Um, 
it's yeah, it's hard for anyone to get access to that, to that kind of stuff. Is it very is it challenging for you guys? I think sort of um, the PGA Tour initially have been they really embraced the show from the beginning, yeah. and actually from season one, Liv did as well. You know, mm. we went over and filmed with Ian Poulter and the guys going over to Liv, and and they were very much part of coming in. You know, mm. there is no. So I think they, they, you know, as some sports know the value more than others, I think they they definitely did. I think this year when they just popped up, you know. Yasser and, and Jay popped up on CNBC and News, I think, in America. It was like my phone went crazy. It was night. It was I was like three-ish here, like nine a.m. or something in the U.S. And nobody knew. Like we were like talking to our contacts at PGA, whatever. But then it's like, how do we how do we react to that? You know, we had a small team up in Canada at the Canadian Open, so we could capture that moment. It's like we okay, well, Rory, let's let's get with Rory and, and we sent up, you know, Pat, who's got a great relationship with Rory to, to sort of jump in his car and get that instant reaction. It was then about how do we get down to the PGA headquarters in, in, um, in Jacksonville, Florida or near Jacksonville, Florida, and get that moment of like Jay having to explain to some of his senior team. Uh, and that negotiation happens at quite senior level. And, but it's about sort of talking to, you know, the powers that be and going, well, it's not going to make sense. You're going to look, you know, the viewers are going to ask where you were and you can't give us all everything when it's positive and then when it's not nothing mm. so i think yeah that episode one into two of season two of full swing is pretty pretty special and then we're going through the same thing this week with you know Lewis's news and, and other news that's that's broken this week with formula one where mm. it's like the team's having to react and find out you know what's going on with individual drivers and, and again that comes from trust it's about you know producers having relationships with you know, players, drivers, agents, and go. Can we, can we, can we be there? Can we jump on? Sometimes you're just luckily you're there. You're embedded, and you're just filming, and something happens. Other times it's, it is really pushing to try and say, well, let's let's be there. Let's tell your side of the story. Don't let the rest of the world tell your story. Let you you. This is what they've got. They've got an opportunity to tell their story. So mm. you know, if you want that, this is this is the greatest platform to do it. They can earn Netflix scores a million subscribers or whatnot. So. I think that's the opportunity that you know a lot of these um, sports stars or agents understand. Mm -hmm. Now you you're in that position where you've got a few of these different projects all going on at the same time. Like, how big has the team got to be? How's like you? I mean, you said there, like you you were lucky you had a, a team up in Canada, but you had to get someone over to to Florida. Like, logistically, how has how's yeah how's box to box changed in, even in the time you've been there? Yeah, it's quite drastically. I think it's about sort of building the sort of um, the senior team, which we'd call like the exec team. So each, each exec has a couple of shows that they oversee. James and Paul are still very hands-on, um, you know, because that's the sort of DNA of the company. And, you know, they'll usually oversee, you know, they'll never let go of Drive to Survive, that's their, their baby. But also season ones of stuff, and, and Paul's now in the US, and James is based here. So I think sort of that, but each individual team, you know, each show has their own core team that only are on that show. So they're not having to react across sports, you know, like the full swing team are only thinking about golf all year. Yeah. The Formula One team are only thinking about Formula One. So that means that, you know, yeah, there's a lot of bodies, but you know, their focus is purely on that sport and that show and that story and those relationships. So yeah, we had to get a crew down, but that was just more that, you know, we make full swing out of New York and they had to get from New York down to Ponte Vedra or whatever it was. So um, yeah, we, you know, Formula One's a bit easier because, you know, most of the teams are in the off-season base just outside of London, so it's just reacting to that. But essentially, yeah, there's a few, quite a lot of bodies, but it's um, it's quite a core, small, intimate unit of people that are really across all of the shows, just making sure that there's that quality control and it doesn't sort of, mm. you know, get away from itself. Mm. Yeah. Tom mentioned, um, yeah, obviously lo lo lots of projects going on for you guys now in the sports space, and one of the most recent ones, I guess most recent new ones that's dropped is um, Six Nations Full Contact. Um, eight episodes of that released, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. A couple, weeks ago, a couple yeah. of weeks ago, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess just like how, how are you guys feeling about how that one came together? Pretty happy with it, first move into rugby. I yeah, think. I think we're saying with like James, for example, James Gay Reese, that's the sort of passion project for him. Rugby is his, yeah. you know, he loves it and, and Welsh rugby in particular. So I think that's always had huge attention on it. And I think sort of that's a, that's a team. It's one of our, like, although Formula One is essentially a team. Rugby sort of the first proper team access doc, you know, mm. cycling as teams and whatever, but really like 
I don't think I've done something else. But that rugby is like you've got that core environment, and also it's a bit different. It's like it's not like a club sport where they're just there. Like we were realised in the first season, like you don't even know who's going to turn up, yeah. who's going to get selected. You know, it's sort of you've got all these plans, and it's like who's going to get called up. And usually, we know from the sort of autumn internationals and through. But I think sort of rugby itself. Um, understands the value of what the show can do. I mm. think season one, there were some tricky sort of access sort of conversations. That I think there was, but mainly because I think a few weeks before we started sort of the actual series, you know, a couple of managers or coaches left their jobs and therefore you've got new people coming in. And with that, they're like, well, wait a minute, I didn't, I didn't sign up for Netflix camels in my, in my dressing room giving a team talk where I'm sort of building a new team or whatever. Mm. So I think... Going into this year, um, season two, hopefully, um, we will we will sort of you know they, there's a trust that's built, um, and also the the beauty of some sports is actually you've got like a year to build trust. Six Nations, you've literally got like a month and a month two month period where mm. the tournament is so sort of short and sweet, which has benefits, but also in a building a trust scenario, I think you're going to see every season that that goes that sort of get better and better and better. One of the things I've uh, as a fan, have found kind of um, interesting to watch from the side is the fact that, like, we, as viewers, we don't know whether or not there's going to be a next season all the time. And you mentioned it there, like you said, hopefully, on, on Six Nations. So at what point do you know, and how do you prepare for a new season if you don't know whether or not this is actually going to happen? Is it something that you do know and you're just not allowed to say? No, you don't. Like, I mean, you... Look, Netflix is all about... It's got to rate, it's got to do well, you know. They've got a lot of fans, there's a lot of people paying for their subscriptions. So they've got to wait for the numbers to come through. They've got to watch the show, and, and the beauty of our show, well, our shows are great because they drop before the tournaments, and then, you know, are you going to do it, you know? But, so we have to, what we call bridging sometimes, where you have to sort of st start the production, mm. but it could easily go, well, actually, it's not, it's not going to happen. Um, we haven't had that, but I think it's sort of, it, it, it will happen one day, possibly. But I think that that's how you do. You get the teams up, and then you go, and then once the numbers drop, or they go, right, okay, we've seen enough data now to say that it's a success, or it's popped here, whatever. Then they'll say, right, we're fully green lighting. Um, but that's the same on every show. I mean, Drive to Survive is, is pretty much the same, even now, going into season seven now. You know what I mean? So I think it's just the nature of um, the platforms, really. They want to make sure that the show is successful. I mean, Drive Survival has had multi-season commissions, like two, two at a time. So you, when that happens, it's great because you can sort of like plan in the off-season, you can get backstory filming. So from our perspective, it would be easier if you knew there was a couple, but you know, you just know that's not the luxury really. Yeah. And like, uh, to flip that around, like Drive to Survive season seven, at which point you know, are we going to get to season 30 where people, before people start getting like, <laughs> Oh, another season of Drive to Survive. <laughs> well, like, have, you, have you seen that yet? Have you had that kind of feedback of like, how do we keep this fresh? I live with a, the no, no, it's like I watch Premier League football, obviously. I don't ever go, this is season yeah. 20 of the live. And I think some sports just lend, lend themselves to the documentary storytelling. And I think sort of Formula One, it's 100% one of those. It's, you know, some parts of the world watch Formula One via the Netflix show rather than live broadcast. And I think... As long as we keep, you know, pushing the boundaries and sort of not settling, I think that's the key, and we keep pushing stories. That's what's brilliant about sport is every year there's a new rookie. Every year there's someone leaving. It's why we love it, mm -hmm. like whether it be sort of our football teams or whatever. So I think sort of that, from a storytelling, I don't think it's ever like, oh, we've run out of stories because, you know, it's in season 20. But, you know, it's about freshening our teams up. It's about making sure that those teams aren't going, well, I've told eight years of this now, you know, maybe go off and do another show or go and do something else and maybe someone else come in and sort of take a new angle at mm. this or someone, you know what I mean? So I think as long as we're pushing the boundaries, it'd be very easy to go, right, let's get comfortable. But I think also Netflix as well, like, they, they, don't, they don't rest on it either. Like, they know the success of Drive Survive and they want to continue that. So the executives at, at, at the streamers as well are, are pushing for more all the time. They're not like, oh, it's just, you know, just like call this in and make it just a, another year. It's mm. like, no, you've got to have this, you've got to have that. What are you doing? You wake up every morning. It's like, were we there? Were we there? I've seen this picture on Instagram. Well, that's the thing now. It's like, everybody sees everybody like, were we there? And you're like, yeah, we were there. We were there. It's okay. Um, so I think, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the beauty. But it's because everybody loves it. Everybody's passionate. And that's, that's good. 
Yeah, and I think um, just on that point, because I guess there are a few people who do think, I guess now that, you know, either every sport kind of has its own documentary series or is thinking about having one at least, and there are those people who are probably making the point that, I guess maybe the one that Tom was leaning towards there is that we're approaching maybe a saturation point. Mm. But as you mentioned, you know, the, as you said, you know, there's new stories to tell every year. That's the, that's the nature of sport. It's it's unscripted, it's entertaining. Um, there's so some will be like, time. you know, we're talking at the moment about sport, which is actually more the business side of the sport. Yeah. And how you put things together and, and all of that. And that's like, oh, it's really exciting because it's like, you're going to get the payoff of the sporting event, but actually you, you're in the room and those deals will be made and you mm. must have seen that. So I think there's always different angles of doing it. I just think, it, you know, people are interested. Yeah. You know, people are sports fans and they want to see it. Are there any um, any sports out there that don't have one yet that you kind of look at and think would lend themselves nicely to this sort of format? Probably can't give any away. Well, the one that we're talking <laughs> about, I was mentioning there that we, we spoke to Netflix about yesterday, I really want to get it away because it's exciting and it's sort of, um, we're all quite passionate about that sport. I think we've got another show that's coming out this year around um, 100 meter sprinting, which yeah. might sound quite niche, but it's been amazing. Like the characters in there, they're like prize fighters, boxers lining up, but they're actually sort of, running as fast in the world, fast as humans. That's awesome. And I think, you know, growing up, everybody knew Linford Christie and Carl Lewis and all of the big names, but sort of Bolt came in and sort of just smashed it out of the park. So no one really knows the current crop. So it's a great opportunity to understand Shikari, who Shakira Richardson is and Noah Lyons and Fred Curley and, you know, Darnell Hughes, etc. So it's like, let's put them on the map and send them into the Olympics so that they've got a bigger presence because they should deserve it. They're like, they are the fastest human on the planet. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm excited about that one. Um, that's one that's sort of coming through. I mean, I think it's been announced now, so it's mm -hmm. fun to talk about. Yeah. I mean, that kind of goes back to what we were talking about right at the start of the show, doesn't it? Like, like what you can do for sports. Do you ever get, um, like, like, be it sports properties or individual leagues coming to you guys and being like, can you, can you come and do us? Like, this, we want to turn on this. This looks like it all. This, we, feel, we feel like we've got a story to tell here. There's a lot of incoming, definitely, but I think we've got to be, we've got to see what what what's the storylines there, what the characters like. You know, you don't just want to just do everything for the sake of the business. You've got to make sure that there's a quality control, and that we keep delivering. And I think you know, I said before we started rolling, like when we were ch chatting, the reason golf has been successful is because it has that bigger political landscape, mm. and that pulls you through. You're not just it's just about who's got that at that point as well. You know, as I said about sprinting, it's like, it's only a hundred meter dash, but there's so much more going on there. You've got the whole Jamaican vibe, you know, Southern America. It's sort of, then you've got the, you know, current Olympic champions is Italian and how does that play into it? It's, so you've got to look at it from a sort of wider lens and go, right, okay, is this storyline interesting or is it just like, hey, this is just another paint by number. And we don't want to do, do that as a, as a business for sure. Yeah. Um, just. I guess last question from me before we let you go, Warren, because I'm conscious of taking up almost about an hour of your time. But um, we've spoken a lot about, I guess, you know, what box to box can do for sport on this podcast, and I guess the impact that it already has had. But obviously, the move into sports documentaries had a pretty significant impact on um, on box to box as well. Just kind of like, what's the next evolution for you guys? I suppose is it is sport? Obviously, sport's going to kind of remain a core focus for you, but you guys looking at expanding into other areas? Yeah, we've got a music project that we're really excited about. Uh, I think we can take our storytelling into other genres as well, and um, that's something that's really exciting. Um, there's hopefully, you know, a move into some scripted space as well, and whether that be, you know, paralleled, unscripted, and scripted projects that, that, that sort of really excite us, um, you know, telling a story, but also through the, through the sort of um, documentary space, but then also doing it as a, as a film or a drama would be really exciting. I think that's where we're at at the moment. It's just sort of what can we do? Because our storytelling is has been slightly different. Um, and I think sort of that's what we're excited about is how can we implement that into other things. And I think the other thing as well is it's th if you look back at the history of, of sort of our founders and whether, you know, they made the Maradona film, James Senna, Amy, et cetera, the, you know, more of that as well, more of that sort of big, what would be known as feature documentaries, you know, is definitely on our radar as well. So we're excited about sort of that's that sort of the next couple of years because it feels like we're in quite a good place to, you know, the sports stuff. We want to make sure that that's where our focus is, or my focus as the head of that department. But then also thinking, how do we how do we do that in in, in other other areas and tell those stories? That we're, I think that's what we're about: we're about premium storytelling and you know 
dialing it up to 100 and making sure that people enjoy it. Because at the end of the day, we're making entertaining programs, and that's our sort of core value. Sure. Now, Sam said that was his last question. Mine is, <laughs> you've got access to, I mean, you've had access to some of like the biggest names in sports. What is your best anecdote from uh, your time working on, on, these, on these shows? I tell you what, I, I, one that you probably wouldn't, I was on the beach, Kelly Slater, so 50 years legend. old, legend, had never really allowed cameras that much. He'd done a sort of documentary, but he never really allowed them in the, in the moment to be with him. And he watched season one of Make or Break, and we went to Hawaii, and we're on the beach, and, and he allowed us into his home. We followed him that week, and at the age of 50, he wins Pipeline, and for those that don't know, look it up. I mean, this wave is, it's called a wave of consequence, because it can pretty much kill you. And I remember being on the beach, and we'd follow, and it was that thing you said earlier about following a narrative and thinking, oh, God, it's not good. We're on the beach, and we'd filmed him, we'd had everything, it was like, this is going to pay off brilliantly. And he was losing to this sort of young rookie that no one really knew apart outside of Hawaii and there was like three seconds on the clock and he gets this wave and he disappears into the barrel and you think oh he's done <laughs> and then he came out and I've never like honestly the buzz of that beach and how that made you feel it's not sort of the winning goal in the Champions League final but it felt like it and it was for him and at 50 years old he wins the the pipeline event and uh yeah rest is history and I think that that for me Obviously, they've, they've been across, and you know, obviously, they were there, and you know, Fox Sports were there at the moment where Lewis loses the title and whatever. But for me personally, that was just such a moment that I'll never forget. Mm. Um, and then also being with him after the event, back at his house, feeling so because 50 years old, you shouldn't be mm. beating a 20 year old in a barrel and pipe in, mm. in Hawaii. So for me, that that was the moment. Obviously, there's been big moments in in golf as well for, for that show. But um, yeah, that was that was the big one. Oh, I love it. It's a great yeah. story. I mean, it sounds like a pretty fun job that you have, Warren. I mean, so I'm sure Tom and I could sit here for like several more hours and uh, quiz you about other other stories from other documentaries. But um, appreciate there's other things to be getting on with. But uh, yeah, thanks so much. Um, really appreciate you coming down and lifting a little a little bit and talking to us on the Sportsbury podcast. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Warren. Cheers.